It was said that in a little German village, during the 30s, people had their own idea of what National Socialism was. Nazism, they thought, had something to do with purity. Indeed, they even believed its most important feature to be sexual denial. And when the old women talked of this stringent demand, they would shake their troubled heads and say, this National Socialism is a tough one. It's only the teacher who might manage it, or maybe the barber. Even though the villagers had their own idea about Nazism, they nevertheless touched on something important. Nazism's dream of creating, through purity and sacrifice, a more beautiful world. The Nazi gospel warns of a world about to collapse, an eternal twilight that threatens to engulf the earth. The Nazis claim to have discovered the source of this threat and took it upon themselves to eradicate it. Purified and preserved from decay, a new Germany would arise, mightier and more beautiful than ever before. Germany celebrates German Arts Day in Munich, 1939. It is the Third Reich's last major art exhibit. Within six weeks, the Second World War would commence. Yes, this government half of which consists of men who once aspired to serve the arts, is conscious of the artist's role as an intermediary, declares Hans Frederick Munk, author and president of the Reich's Chamber of Literature. He continues, this government, born out of the opposition to rationalism, knows the people's inner longings, their boundless dreams, to which only the artist can give form. Though this claim may be hyperbole, it is not entirely groundless. Failed artists were characteristic of the leadership of the Third Reich. Several of the men nearest Hitler had made serious artistic endeavors. Goebbels, for one, who had written a novel as well as poetry and plays. Or Rosenberg, the party ideologist who had dabbled in painting and entertained literary ambitions. Or von Schirach, Hitler's youth leader, who was considered one of the Reich's foremost poets. and Hitler himself, a failed painter who dreamt of being an architect. He never abandoned the dream. His artistic efforts extended into the 1920s. Pedantically drawn watercolors in the style of postcards. Oh, how I'd love to stay here working with art, he declares from his retreat shortly before war breaks out. He's an artist, not a politician. And as soon as the war is over, he will retire and devote himself to art. At 18, Hitler had unsuccessfully applied to the Academy of Art in Vienna. Refusal was a hard blow, but he hid his disappointment. Instead of returning to his home in Linz, he remained in Vienna. He drifts around Vienna, goes to the opera, paints a little, 
Occasionally, he devotes himself to some far-fetched artistic project. He and his childhood friend, August Kubitschek, make an amateurish effort based on an idea that Richard Wagner abandoned to write an opera together. Three years earlier, he and Kubitschek have had a decisive opera experience. And at the theater in Linz, they have seen Wagner's opera, Rienzi. The opera is set in medieval Rome. Rienzi, the people's spokesman, rises against the aristocracy. He wants to turn the clock back 15 centuries and re-establish the Roman Republic of Antiquity. In that spirit, he lets himself be made tribune of the people. But Rienzi falls victim to a conspiracy. He fights his last battle in the capital as it crashes, burning around him. Hitler is deeply moved by Rienzi. Overwhelmed, he outlines for Kubitschek his plans for his own future and that of his people. Later he would say, it was in that hour it all began. This experience cemented three fixations in Hitler that would never lose their grip on him. His fixations on Linz, his home city, on antiquity, and on Wagner. Whoever would understand Nazism must first know Wagner, said Hitler. And indeed, Wagner occupied a special place in Hitler's imagination. Wagner's political tracks were early favorites of Hitler's. Already in Linz, he had fantasized over his own operas. So extravagant as to eclipse Wagner's works. It was opera's scenic possibilities that fascinated Hitler. The fantastic illusion, the flight from reality. In Wagner, he saw his idol. Creative artist and politician in one person. Hitler borrowed Wagner's props, anti-Semitism, the cult of a Nordic legacy, the myth of pure blood, all gave counter to Hitler's worldview. From Wagner, too, came the notions of art as the basis of a new civilization, and the artist prince, risen from the people, who would unite life and art to herald the advent of the new state. Hitler found use for his artistic bent in political work. He created Nazi props, everything, from uniforms to flags and standards. With his own sketches and instructions, he gave the Nazi movement its form. Hitler's 1923 sketch of the party standard The goldsmith Gar prepares from Hitler's sketches the first standard of the NSDAP. Propaganda provided the outlet for Hitler's artistic ambitions. The Nazi mass rallies were quasi-art of gigantic proportions with Hitler as set designer, director, and leading actor. Mass rallies also embodied a central Nazi ideal, the myth of the body of the German folk. This myth, 
the people, the masses seen as one body with its own circulatory system would become a basic element in the Nazi vision of racial purification. Thirtieth of January, nineteen thirty-three. The Nazis celebrate Hitler's seizure of power. Feverish activity is begun to quickly gain control over every level of German society. Everywhere, Nazi activists force their way in. A proclamation is made in March. What German artists expect of the new government. The paper's source is a coalition of Nazi cultural groups. Their program demands that Bolshevik unart and unculture be destroyed, and they offer at the same time to stand like seasoned soldiers in the vanguard of the struggle. They also demand that all purged works be shown publicly and then burnt as a warning to all. In 1933, a wave of exhibitions of so-called degenerate art washes over Germany. Mannheim, Nuremberg, Dessau, Stuttgart, Dresden. Already in the early 20s, art was of first-rank importance to the Nazis. Cultural degeneration was seen by many as a genuine threat. Decay was a modish word among the German petty bourgeoisie. Behind the calamities that had plagued Germany, cultural Bolshevism in particular, the Jew was felt to be the instigator, the ringleader. with its skewed perspectives of avant-garde art, was to the Nazi an augury of impending doom. To them, the chaos they perceived in it was visible evidence of spiritual and intellectual depravity. In 1928, under the leadership of Rosenberg, the first Nazi cultural organization was founded. The National Socialist Society for German Culture. One of the six founders is SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Later, the society renames itself the Defense Guild for German Culture. The offensive against modern art soon took on a hygienic character. Modern artists' works were said to show signs of mental illness. Their creators were ripe for the madhouse. One of the Defense Guild's most influential members, art theorist Paul Schultz Domberg, begins a nationwide speaking tour in January 1931. In the world of German art, a struggle to the death rages, not unlike the struggle in politics. And it must be fought with the same gravity and singleness of mind, he says. Showing lantern slides to illustrate the lectures, he projects his vision of art hygiene. By choosing pictures of deformed cases from medical journals, and comparing them with modern art, he claims to show a link between physical degeneration and artistic perversion.
The pictures and diagnoses are supplied to him by Dr. Weygandt of Hamburg University Psychiatric Clinic. In Schultz Naumberg's view, art is not only a mirror of racial health. Here he refers to antiquity and the Renaissance, but has as its duty, even as the Grecian marbles did, to be a representative expression of the people's longing for racial fulfillment. On seeing these pictures, no one can identify them with anything but the misshapen wretches in clinics and madhouses, where the blighted and degenerate of our species are gathered, concludes Schultz Naumberg. No spiritually healthy person needs to be convinced that an outlook is revealed here, which must be forever banished from the new Germany. On July 14, 1933, a new law is enacted. This law will help the sick to be healthy. It is also important that the strong and strong are healthy. It permits mandatory sterilization of the insane, the asocial, and the hereditarily tainted. But this law is only the first step in an ongoing process. In March 1935, an exhibition opens in Berlin, The Miracle of Life. Here, the physician emerges as the spearhead of Nazi racial policy. In the quest for pure blood, the enemies are the Jew, race mixing, and degeneration. In a special section, Schultz Naumberg's comparisons turn up. Another section is devoted to the mentally ill and asocial. A grisly vision is conjured up of idiots and retards gradually outnumbering normal people. Still other sections deal with race, preservation, and refinement. Our first principle of beauty is health, Hitler declares. The methods of medical science will ensure that end. With the physician as esthetician, aesthetic problems became medical ones. This exhibition already defines the presumptions underlying mass murder. No longer does the physician minister to the individual. Now he is the healer of the corpus of the race, a biological warrior fighting diseased and inferior elements that threaten the body of the German folk. Now the physician in uniform comes to the fore of society. The Nazification of physicians began in the first months of Nazi rule, as Jewish doctors were stripped of their positions. This mass expulsion created undreamt of career possibilities. Physicians with the right ideology quickly soared to the top. Special schools offered courses in Nazi medicine. No other profession could boast so many party members. 45% of German physicians belonged to the party. Mein Kampf clearly states the goal of Nazism's biomedical pioneers. A state which preserves in a time of pollution its finest racial elements must one day be lord of the earth. 
Our followers must never forget this when they compare the sacrifices to the envisioned results. Gerhard Wagner, the Third Reich's chief doctor, promises that in the future, too, we shall fulfill our mission according to the Führer's will, to create the new German man.